Father God, thank you for today. Thank you. I'm all so amped up hearing all these confessions of faith, these children, these babies, these, these parents, brothers and sisters in Christ who, who, who believe in you, who believe in your work, Lord. And Lord, I pray right now in this moment as we delve into your word, you tell us in Isaiah that your word will not return void. You have a word for each of us and in only the way that you can, God, you have a way where it feels like this word was for me today. I pray, Lord, that we would have a posture right now of surrender. I pray right now, Lord, that all the distractions, even of this service, all, all the, the happenings, all that is going on, all that, all that has happened this week, all that is ahead of us, Lord, right now, I pray that you would help us, Spirit of God, that you would open up the eyes of our hearts, that we would unplug from the distractions of this world that you would keep at bay the, the attacks of the enemy to divide and distract and discourage. And right now, Lord, we would join Mary in sitting at your feet and listening to you. So have your way, Lord. We are here. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Illuminate these words, Spirit of God. Speak. In your name we pray. Amen. You know, as we think about our family service, I love to reflect on the story of our church, the story of how we got here, the story of, of a church that at one point was gathering at an old Presbyterian church on the other side of town with numbers that were dwindling and prayers for the Lord to, to, to bring in new energy, bring in new life, bring in new families. And then one Sunday, all of a sudden, all of these farmers and these dairymen and all these families showed up. There were some conversations that happened and they showed up. And there was this new life all of a sudden at Cornerstone. And this new life started to grow, and this new life started to get exciting, and families started to come and started to join, and quickly started to realize that they had outgrown this beautiful, wonderful sanctuary over on Trinity. And the elders and the leaders of the church thought, perhaps the Lord is calling us to, to get a new building to anticipate that God would, would continue to bless and, and use our church to proclaim his good news and to invite people to follow. And in faith, they purchased this land and God provided it in a wonderful way and they built a building that was much bigger than the size of the congregation anticipating God's blessing and God's faithfulness. And over that time, starting to add on to staff, starting to add on a preschool, that would bless the community, starting to add on youth staff and children's staff and, and seeing families in our community continue to be blessed to the point where, where we didn't have enough space for, for rooms. And so they had to add on a whole new wing and the, and the, the idea of, of growing as a church, not just in attendance, but growing deep and wanting to be a church where we are discipled and we are, we're in small groups and we're, and we're growing. And so building on a whole youth wing and, and adding on to the preschool so that families could be growing in Christ and, and, and talking about their faith and, and going deep into the word of God and then continuing to wanting to trust God's faithfulness. Continuing to want to, to be a church where we are faithful to the things that God puts before us. And, 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 and even over the last few years, seeing the Lord uh, bring about a, a new garden, seeing a counseling center come, come up, seeing, seeing a Cornerstone Espanol join us and, and our desire to reflect our community and to have more di diversity and seeing staff come in and, and just continuing to see a, a room full of people who love the Lord and love this church and love what God is up to and have been faithful and have all of this zeal and as I was thinking about that, and, and I, I love to reflect on, on what God has done and how wonderful and great he, at, he is as I think about where he's leading us. 
It strengthens me, it excites me, it inspires me. And as I was looking at this text today and thinking about our story, thinking about God's story here at Cornerstone, I was struck with this challenge though. Because as good as it is to think about all that God has doing, as good as done, as good as it is to remember where we come from, it can be really easy, don't hear this, don't miss this, it can be really easy to start to forget what we're about. To start to think that the programs, that the things, that, that, that all the events are pretty great and to miss the entire point. And the question is this, that Paul brings to you and me today that wants to keep us centered on, and this is the question that he's bringing in Romans chapter 10. It's really simple. What are you doing with Christ? What are you doing with Christ? When you hear that word, what does that mean for you? Who is that for you? And in this text, it seems to me that Paul gives us three opportunities for how we can respond to Christ himself. How we can respond to Jesus. In Romans, the end of 9 and going into chapter 10, Paul has just talked about the faithfulness and the sovereignty of God and his work throughout the entire story of Scripture in bringing the gospel to the world. And in verse 30, he starts to talk about ethnic Israel and their story. And he talks about how, how they have spent their entire story as a, as a people of God going all the way back to Father Abraham. When God shows up and tells Abraham, I'm going to choose you to be a special people. And I'm going to bless you. And through you, you are going to be a blessing to all the nations. And he goes through and he blesses them. And you follow the story of the people of God. And they have the law given by Moses. And they're called to follow this law. And constantly there's this this anticipation of a need for a savior and a need to be in the presence of God. But in this moment, Paul's telling the church that Israel are stumbling. As we ask the question of what they're doing with Christ, they're stumbling. He says, you're so close, but yet you're so far. And I believe he's saying something like this. Quit tripping. Turn to the person next to you and say, quit tripping. Quit tripping. Quit stumbling. Look at what he says here in verse 30. He says this. What shall we say then that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it? That is a righteousness that is by faith. He is anticipating in the early church, there was, in the Roman church, there was a huge collection of, of Gentile Christians. Rome had actually expelled the Jewish Christians. And so the the church was predominantly Gentiles and then the Jews were allowed back into Rome and there's this mix of Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians and and, and they're asking this question. These Gentiles who, who they, they, they didn't follow Abraham, they didn't follow the ways of God, but yet all of a sudden there's this new revelation that through Christ there could be righteousness for all through faith. He says, Israel, verse 31, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, they did not succeed in reaching that law. This is the whole story of the Old Testament. If you follow the story of the Old Testament, time and time again, God tells the people, shows up and brings the people out of disobedience and out of sin, and they constantly fall short, and they constantly miss, mess it up. It says, why? It says, because they did not, the people of God, pursue it by faith. But as if it were based on works, they have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. This is a reference to a prophecy in Isaiah. 
And the stumbling stone we know is Christ. And Paul is telling them here, he's saying, the entire story of Israel leads to Jesus. It goes all the way back. You can actually find Christ throughout the entire Old Testament. There's all of this anticipation, and and he gave them the prophets, and and he gave them the law, and all of it points to a need for a Savior, for the Messiah, for the Christ to come. And he says, you've been, you've been waiting all of this time. It's right here, it's right, he's right here, and yet, you're missing it. You're st- instead of receiving him, instead of enjoying the, the gift of righteousness through him, you are stumbling over the grace of Christ, over the, the, the gift of his very presence. They're stumbling over grace. Paul goes on in the following verses to remind them of Moses. He reminds them of Moses. Moses was the great prophet who came in and brought them the law. If you remember the story of Exodus, it says that he comes into Pharaoh and he and he and through the power of God gets the people out of captivity and slavery and and leads them, and then God gives them the law. And this law is the way for the people to be in a right relationship with God. It's it's, it's the way to truly be blessed. In Leviticus 18.5, we learn of this. It says, you shall therefore keep my statutes, and you should keep my rules. And if a person does them, if you follow the law, you shall live by them. I am the Lord. This call to live by the law. And if you know the story of the people of God, they, they, they instantly, Moses goes up, to, up, up the mountain, he gets the Ten Commandments, he gets the law, and he comes down, and what are they doing? They're breaking the law. They're worshiping a false, graven image. And because of that, God punishes them and they wander in the wilderness for 40 years and then there's this moment in Deuteronomy when Moses is getting ready to lead them with the law again back into the promised land, back in to to this promise of God's presence and this this promise that, that he's had for them and in Deuteronomy chapter 30, Paul is referencing this in, in, in this passage. In verse five, when he writes about Moses and he talks about Moses and the righteousness of God, he's talking about Moses. If you could turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 30, I think it's really wonderful to see the connections here with Moses and to see what what Paul is doing as he's writing to the Jewish people. He says this, Moses is with the people of God and they've been stumbling They've been falling short, and he's calling them to to repent. He's calling them to follow, and he says this. He says in verse 11, this commandment, chapter 30, Deuteronomy 30, verse 11, he says, this commandment that I command you today, it's not too hard for you. Neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us? Does that sound familiar? This is what Paul is referencing in Romans chapter 10. This is a reference to Moses going up the mountain, going up into the mountain which which represents the presence of God, heaven itself, to get the law and bring it down. He says, it's not about sending Moses up. Paul interprets this as Christ coming down. He says, that we may hear it and that we may do it. He says, neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us to bring it to us that we may hear it and that we may do it. Paul grabs this and he connects this to Christ's death and his resurrection and and he's connecting Moses and and the story of him leading the people through the, the, the parting of the Red Sea and the very presence of God, the most memorable miracle about God changing everything when they thought they were going to die, God flipping the tables and saving them. In in essence, giving resurrection, a hope of a new way. And in Romans chapter 10, Paul's grabbing on to the story of Moses, the story that the people remember, one of their favorite stories. And he says, he's making this bold 
statement. He's saying this story back in Deuteronomy 30 when Moses is prophesying about the people's future. He's saying this story is about Jesus. Look at what it says. See before, in verse 15, see I have set before you today life, good and death. He says, but the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. Moses is talking to a people who are struggling with the law. If you've been in the book of Romans, you know that we've been broken by the law. And what's fascinating about this passage, what's so fascinating here, is that Moses is prophesying that there will come a day when the people are able to keep the law. And he says it's through Christ. And he says you need to stop stumbling over Jesus. And as I was thinking about this, our teaching team, we were asking this question, how, how, how do we stumble over Christ? Are there ways that maybe as we read this, that we stumble over the grace of God? Perhaps starting to think, oh, you know what? I, I've done all of these things, I, I read my Bible, I, I pray, I, I give, I, I, I've, been, I've been faithfully following, and we start to think that the things that we do have earned us something. And we start to think that our own zeal, our own accomplishments have gotten us something. And Paul is calling the Jewish church, and I believe he's calling us to remember that we are called to be a people that don't stumble over this call to the law, that stumble over the need for a savior, and that we receive Christ. And so for some of us, perhaps we find ourselves stumbling, and Paul is calling you, don't stumble. The second piece, I believe, is allegiance. Allegiance. To truly be, to, to, to be devoted and to trust in who Jesus is. He says the word is, the, not the world, the word is near you. He says it's in you. He's calling the people, that, it's right there at your, at, your, at, the, at your fingertips. He says don't miss this. It's right here. He's saying, take that step. He's calling to the Jewish church. You can see his, his heart is breaking over people that are missing the grace of God. Look at what he says. He says, but what does it say? He says, the word is near you in verse eight. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart. Now what's that word? What's that word he's talking about? He says, he says it's the word of faith that we proclaim. This, this word for faith, this pistis, is related to, to confessing your faith, to, to believing in who Jesus is. He says this, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what? You will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. He's calling the person who's been stumbling to allegiance to Christ. He's calling the person who's been, who's been so wrapped up in all the things that we're to do to say, your life needs to be about Christ and about his work, to be devoted to him and who he is. That you need a savior. And I love the language of confess with your mouth. There's an actual step that you must do. You must speak that he is your Lord, that he is your Savior, but believe in your heart. The heart in, in, in the Hebrew uh, philosophy and in the Hebrew writing is all about all of you, not just part of you, not just on Sundays or after a meal, that, that all of you would believe that Jesus is Lord. And that word for Lord is incredibly important. It's kurios. In the Greek, it's translated in the Old Testament as the word Yahweh itself. And so to say that Jesus is Lord, it's to say that Jesus is God. 
It's that he's not just a good prophet. He's not just a, a good guru who tells us good ways to live. It's saying that he has existed eternally before all of creation as the second person of the Trinity and that God the Father sent him to be the king, to save us from our sins, to resurrect and give us hope for life eternal. And when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you're not just saying, oh, there's some guy who was really good and he's my king. You're saying Jesus was God. You're saying Jesus is God who came to us and he lived perfectly and this is a part of history and he took on flesh and he lived a perfect life and he died on a cross for my sins but he didn't stay dead. Three days later he resurrected and Paul says you confess that he's God, believe in your heart that he's Lord and what? That he raised him from the dead. Why is it important that we also believe in the resurrection? Because Jesus is still alive. Because Jesus is the king. He's the king of the whole story. And so the Christian faith is not just about getting out of hell. That's a wonderful, beautiful hope. But more important, it's about being in the presence of God and being a child of the king and serving the king on earth as it is in heaven. It's the kingdom coming into this space. And Paul here is inviting the church, he's inviting you and me to confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord and that he is king and that he's our savior. And what I love is this has been the story the whole time. I love that Paul goes back to Deuteronomy 30 because he's talking to a Jewish church they know the law, and they're thinking, oh man, we still gotta, I get it, you can have Jesus, but let's add on a little bit of this. Let's, let's still add on the Sabbath, let's, let's still add on the, the, all of the ceremonial stuff that we need to live and go through, and we need to do all, and so it's, it's Jesus plus this, but the gospel is that Jesus plus nothing is everything. And Paul is doing a hyperlink back to Deuteronomy 30, as a matter of fact, when Moses is prophesying to the people in Deuteronomy 30 about the day that they will be able to follow and that they will be able to love the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, with all their strength, that when they will be able to truly live out the call that God has called them to, in verse six of chapter 30, he says this, the Lord your God, look at the prophecy that he says, he will circumcise your heart. That word circumcised, he will change your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God. Look at what it's doing. He, he says he will do something in your heart so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and that you may live. Remember back in Leviticus it says to truly love God is to be able to follow. And this is a story of the whole Bible. And this is why Paul is saying, beloved, you're missing it. And actually, go back and look at the prophets. Look at the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah came to the people in exile and he's talking to them. He says this, he says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I will do something new. And like the covenant that I made with, your, with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, they couldn't follow. Though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For in this covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord, he says what? I will put my law where? Within them and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, know the Lord, for they all shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. 
Paul's writing to the church. He's writing to these Jewish brethren, and he's saying, you're missing it. You're stumbling over the Messiah. He's, he's either going to be a stumbling stone or he's going to be a cornerstone. He's either going to be someone you stumble on or someone you stand on. And there's nothing in between. What are you going to do with Christ? Ezekiel says this, I will give you a new heart. And I will put a new spirit within you. He says, I will remove the heart of flesh, stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. And I will cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. As you reflect on these truths, as you ask this question, what are you doing with Christ? I would encourage you, don't stumble over him. Believe in him. Follow him. Pledge allegiance to him. For some of us, though, perhaps we know of this, but there's a stubbornness and a hardness, and there's this third response to Christ. It's not just a stumbling, it's a refusing. It's so simple, yet so hard. Don't miss this. And we miss this. As Paul wraps up this chapter, he's writing to the church, and I can feel his heart breaking over these brethren, these brothers, these sisters, these family members that they're so close, but they're missing Jesus for the law. And they're refusing him. And he says this, he he quotes all of these Old Testament prophecies about the the grace of God and, and the story of God, and he closes with this challenging, sobering text. He says, but of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. The story of scripture is God handing out this gift. And the question is, are you going to refuse it? Are you going to stumble over it? Or are you going to receive it and follow? Really, the question is, what are you going to do? What are we going to do? Our membership class, we talk about this truth, that we believe that Jesus changes everything. We believe that all of the Christian life is about the, the good news of King Jesus coming to save us. So the most important thing that we can do in response to this is not to stumble, but to stand on the cornerstone. So the best response that we can have is to come to Jesus, is to come to Jesus. Matthew 11, 28 says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. This is the good news of the invitation of God to come to Jesus. I love hearing the stories of our eight new baptisms. Stories of these, of these brothers and sisters in Christ who have, who have heard the Lord calling them and felt the need, the desire to take that step and to confess their faith that Jesus is Lord. And they're all so different from the Gudino family and, and the last three in the family, in the household coming and saying, man, I saw, I've seen what God is doing in Glenn, I've seen what God is doing in mom and dad, and I, I believe that I want this to happen for me as well. For Lonnie and, 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 your, and your story, wherever, wherever you are, yeah, there you are, of, of a friend in, 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 in the midst of a dark night, a very difficult time of, of the Lord showing up in a radical way and a friend inviting her in to, into church and, and, and coming to say, I want to grow and, and, and continue to follow Jesus in the midst of a very difficult time. And I believe that moments like this are incredible invitations for us to come to Jesus. Second, 
because we believe that, that he is the king, the resurrecting king who does the resurrecting power in us, we don't just come to Jesus, we believe that we are called to grow in Jesus. We are called to be a people who, it's okay to not be okay. We say this at Celebrate Recovery, just don't stay there. It's okay to, to not have everything figured out, but we do believe that a, a relationship with Christ does start to heal, does start to bring about, about, about recovery, does start to bring hope into our life. You don't just snap your fingers and all of a sudden everything's okay, but there's this peace that happens. And it happens in faith community. And so as a church, that's why we have our family service. And that's why we have small groups. And that's why we have celebrate recovery. And that's why we have grief share. And that's why we have all of these Bible studies for the, the ladies on Tuesdays and the men's and the brothers' Bibles and barbecues. Because we believe that we are called to be a people who, because of our allegiance to Christ, we are growing in him. Not just on a Sunday morning, throughout the whole week. And so I encourage you, let's continue as the people of God to grow in Christ, one of my favorite verses, 2 Corinthians 3 says this, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being what? Transformed, metamorphous, changed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So we are called to be a people who come to Jesus, we're called to be a people who grow in Jesus, but also, beloved, we're called to be a people who go with Jesus. We are sent people. We are people of the King. And when Jesus left this world and ascended into heaven and gave us his spirit, he told his disciples what? Go and make disciples. And behold, I will be with you until the end of the age. We all have this gospel call that God has gifted each and every one of us to go and share this good news. 1 Peter 4.10 says, and each has received a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything, hear this, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belongs glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Perhaps you're wondering, I, I, I get that, Logan. That's a cute little thing. You know, say, go with Jesus. Go, why don't you go make a shirt? Yeah, great. What does that mean? If you're wondering that, I would encourage you. We have that serve class next week. It's a class all about understanding your gifts, your abilities, your passions, and how God has uniquely gifted every single one of you to join in the good work of going with Jesus. Remember in Romans 10, what does Paul say? He says, how can they know if the word is not preached? How can it be preached if the people are sent? People, I'm sending you. Go with Jesus. We are called to be ascending people and God has gifted every single one of you. If you are a part of this family of God, we're gonna learn in Romans 12 that you have a unique gift, you have a unique call that you need to give to the church. That you've been called by Jesus to serve in. And if you don't know what that is, great, let's figure it out. For some of us, it's, it's, it's just continuing to do the work that God has already called us to, but I would encourage you and exhort you, let's be a people that have the beautiful feet that Paul is talking about. What does he say? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. What's the good news? It's the gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as I was thinking about this, I was just thinking about our church, thinking about how kind of I started and thinking about our story and thinking about all the things that God has done. And I felt the Lord tell me, Logan, don't stumble. The story of your church, the story of my church is the story of the King of Kings. It's the story of Jesus. The emphasis is not on the things you've done. 
It's not on the programs you do. It's not on the difference that you think you can make. It's about me. That's what God's saying. And he's saying, do not forget that he has been faithful in the past and he will be faithful in the future. And he's saying, follow me. And he's saying, continue to stand on me. Let Christ be your cornerstone. Church, it can be really easy in, the, in our day and age to stumble on ourselves. It can be really easy to even stumble on our accomplishments. It can be really easy to even start to stumble on our dreams and aspirations. We need to continue to be a people that fall into the arms of God and rest in him. That whole, that whole equation, come to Jesus, grow in Jesus, go with Jesus, that's not a linear, like, one-time thing. It's an ongoing process. We are constantly coming to Jesus, and as we come to Jesus, we grow in him, and as we grow in him, we go with him. Do you see this? This is why we're reading our Bibles and we're praying together because we believe that this is how we come to him and we learn from him and we grow in him. I encourage you, think on this. And so as you reflect on this, as we prepare to celebrate baptism, as we as you prepare to worship together, as we prepare to sing Cornerstone, to sing that we're not gonna be a people that stumble, we're gonna be a people that stand in Christ. As you do this, I would encourage you, think about what's this next step for me? I don't wanna be one that refuses, I don't wanna be one that stumbles, I wanna be one that is committed, that believes, that has an allegiance to Christ. Would you pray with me, Spirit of God. I pray, Lord, that as we reflect on these beautiful words from Romans, God, you make it so simple. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that you, Jesus, are Lord, and that you, God, raise Christ from the dead, then you will be saved. And Lord, in this moment, perhaps there's someone here watching online, perhaps there's someone here who's been curious, perhaps there's someone here who's been hurting, perhaps there's someone here who's been walking the walk, who's, been, who's grown up in the church, but they've never made that confession. I just wanna invite you right now to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, to pray, Lord, I believe in you. Lord, I believe that you are God and that you died on the cross for my sin, that I am a sinner in need of grace and I receive you, Jesus, to be the king of my life and I accept you and I commit my life. I pledge allegiance to you, Jesus. Have your way. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, amen?